This is Lecture Number 10 on Kings by Dr. Robert Vinoy of Biblical Theological Seminary. Lecture Number 10. We were in 1 Kings 13. We looked at that chapter where the man of God out of Judah comes out to the north to Bethel and prophesies against the altar of Jeroboam and, among other things, gives a long-term prophecy that a king called Josiah will eventually burn the bones of those false prophets and priests on that particular altar. And then there were some short-term predictions that were fulfilled as well that authenticated the longer-term prediction. Let's go on to the fourth thing, and that is Ahijah's warning, and this is 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 1 to 20. All right, the question has to do with what we touched on last time. The question is, this man of God out of Judah is deceived by the old prophet in the northern kingdom, and how do we explain what is going on there? It seems to me that the old prophet in the north was a true prophet. He heard about what this man of God out of Judah had done about confronting Jeroboam at that altar. I think he was sympathetic to what he had done, and it seems that he desired to have some fellowship with this man, this godly man from the south. He was probably isolated and didn't have much contact with other believing faithful there. In order to do that, he lies. Seems to me out of self-interest. Now, of course, when he lied, he wasn't performing the function of a true prophet. That's why I prefer to speak of prophecy as a function rather than as an office. It seems to me prophecy is when the Lord puts his word in the mouth of some individual so that the words he speaks are God's words. But that doesn't mean that every time they open their mouths, they are performing the function of a prophet. This old man, even though he had done that and was known as a prophet, in this particular instance, he sins, and he did something he obviously should not have done. Now, the man of God out of Judah, on the other hand, had been given a direct word from the Lord, and he was not to go back the same way and was not to eat bread or drink water with anyone in the north. But he listened to this old man when he said that he had a revelation. He listened to the old prophet, even though it contradicted the previous revelation that he himself had received. He should not have listened to the old prophet because God does not contradict himself. God would not say one thing to the one person and then something else to the other. So I think both these men were at fault. Now, the man of God out of Judah that disobeyed God's word then was judged for it. Then the old prophet performs the function of a true prophet when he says, This is what's going to happen to you. You're not going to rest with your fathers. And he was attacked and killed by the lion. So at that point, he's again performing the function of a true prophet. But when he lied to him, it was certainly a very wicked thing that he did. It was a sinful act. You can be a true prophet, yet not be a good man. Usually, a prophet is a godly person, but you can be a true prophet and a bad man. This fellow illustrates that. Balaam was a heathen soothsayer, yet he was a true prophet because the Lord put his words in his mouth. He wanted to curse Israel, but couldn't. Instead, he blessed Israel. I think cases like that are exceptions, but I think it's important you realize the distinction that a prophet is not always a prophet in everything that he does. He can misspeak. So you perform a prophetic function, and I think that's a better way to speak of what happens. Another example. Take Nathan when he was asked by David, Shall I build a temple, build a house for the Lord? And Nathan says, Go ahead and do it. The Lord bless you. But well, you see, that was his own word. It wasn't God's word, because the Lord came to him that night and says, Go back and tell David, You aren't to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house, in the sense of a dynasty. So Nathan misspoke. He spoke when he was being asked by David to speak as a prophet. He spoke as a man. He had to go back and correct himself when the word of the Lord came to him. It is the recognition of God's word being spoken through a prophet. And if that prophet is going to be ridiculed, then it's not a personal thing. It's an office thing. In the case of Elisha, I think they recognized that he was the successor to Elijah. 
And even though they were taunting him with being bald, their disrespect went beyond just that to his function and his office. Verse 2 of Second Kings, chapter 23, says, From there Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking on the roads, youths came out of the town and jeered at him. Go on up, you bald head! Go on up, you bald head! He turned around and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord, and two bears came and mauled forty-two of the youths. The comment I put in the NIV study Bible at this point is, Elisha pronounced a curse similar to the covenant curse of Leviticus chapter 26, verses 21 and 22. The result gave warning of the judgment that would come on the entire nation should it persist in disobedience and apostasy. Thus, Elisha's first acts were indicative of his ministry that would follow God's covenant blessings and would follow those who looked to him. You see that there was the healing of the water there at Jericho, which was the answer to the one of those questions. His first act, beginning his ministry, was indicative of blessings that would come to those who looked to him because covenant curses would fall upon those who would turn away from him. So it seems to me there's some symbolism involved in the relationship, or attitude you might say, of those youths who were against Elisha and the attitude of the nation towards the Lord. In that action, it's not just a personal revenge getting back at somebody who was taunting him. Its significance is reflected in his office. But it also reflects the attitude of the nation towards the Lord, because certainly the attitude towards Elisha involved that attitude towards the Lord, since he was a prophet of the Lord. The text leaves open the fact if they were killed or not. I'm not sure what the Hebrew word is behind it. I could make a note of checking that out and try to remember next week to make a comment on it. Well, that's Second Kings chapter 2, verse 24, and the pronouncement of Elisha upon the youths. Let's get back to Ahijah's warning, and this is 1 Kings chapter 14. The same prophet who had told Jeroboam that he would be given a kingdom now declares that it will be taken away from him. That's in verses 7 and following of the chapter 14. The Lord tells Ahijah, Go tell Jeroboam, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I raised you up from among the people and made you a leader over my people Israel. I tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. But you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commands and followed me with all his heart, doing only what was right in my eyes. You have done more evil than all who lived before you. You have made for yourself other gods, idols made of metal. You have provoked me to anger and thrust me behind your back. Because of this, I am going to bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will burn up the house of Jeroboam as one burns dung until it is all gone. Dogs will eat those belonging to Jeroboam who die in the city, and birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. The Lord has spoken. And that's the end of Ahijah's words to Jeroboam. So that message of judgment is given to Jeroboam by the prophet Ahijah. The setting, as you remember, is Jeroboam's inquiry to Elijah about his sick son. He sends his wife in disguise, and he doesn't fool Elijah by that, but he's told that the son will die. And you find that in verse 12, where he says, As for you, you go back home. When you set foot in your city, the boy will die. I think it's interesting that you get a reflection of what is often termed the covenant lawsuit. I think you get a reflection of that covenant lawsuit and the judgment that Ahijah pronounces. You notice in verses 7 and 8, Ahijah recites the gracious acts of the Lord. He says, I raised you up from among the people and made you a leader over my people Israel, and I tore the kingdom away from the house of David, and I gave it to you. Those of you who are familiar with that analogy between the Hittite treaties and the biblical covenant material... The Hittite treaties begin with that historical prologue. And so does the biblical covenant material with the gracious acts of the Lord. I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, do this, that, and the other thing. 
so that when Israel turns away from the covenant and a prophet is sent to bring Israel back to the covenant, you'll often find in the prophetic books, now this isn't in every prophetic book, but it's a prophetic speaking, that prophets will use sort of a form that reflects that covenant form. They will first recite the gracious acts of the Lord. Here's what I've done, and here's what you've done. I've been faithful and gracious, but you've turned away and have been disobedient. And then pronounce a sentence. So you see here in verses 7 and the first part of verse 8, you have the gracious acts of the Lord. And in the second part of verse 8 and verse 9, you have the indictment. And it says, but you have not been like my servant David. You have done more evil than all who were before you. You have made for yourselves other gods. And then the third element is the sentence that you have in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 10 and following, when it says, because of this, here's what I'm going to do. So I think you get some reflection of that in the form of the message here that Ahijah brings. All right, that was the fourth thing, Ahijah's warning to Jeroboam. The fifth thing on your sheet is Nadab's reign, and that's in 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 25 to 28. In chapter 14 and into the early part of chapter 15, you switch back to Judah there with Rehoboam. But then at chapter 15, verse 25, you read, Nadab, son of Jeroboam, became king of Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. He reigned over Israel two years. So Nadab reigns only two years. You only have these four verses that speak of him, and that's verses 25, 26, 27, and 28. He's really not an important king, and he's killed in what you might call a palace revolt. You read in verse 27, Basha, son of Ahijah, not the same Ahijah as the prophet, by the way, but Basha, son of Ahijah of the house of Issachar, plotted against him, and he struck him down at Gibbethon, a Philistine town, while Nadab and all Israel were besieging it. Basha killed Nadab in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and succeeded him as king. So then that brings us to a discussion of the dynasty of Basha, and I have several subpoints here. A is his succession. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this dynasty of Basha, but his succession is 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 27 through 30, and then verses 33 and 34. As we already know, Basha killed Nadab, who was Jeroboam's son, and he killed all the house of Jeroboam, fulfilling the prediction of Elijah that Jeroboam's house would be wiped out. So you read in verse 29, he did not leave Jeroboam anyone to breathe. He destroyed them all according to the word of the Lord given through his servant Ahijah, the Shilonite, meaning he's from Shiloh, because of the sins of Jeroboam. And then the second part, B, is his wars against Judah. And that's in 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 32. We had a brief statement, there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, throughout the reigns. Now, we read more of that when we saw what happened in the rule of Asa in the south and Basha in the north. The occasion for the hostility was the attempt to prevent northerners from going south to worship. Jeroboam built the altars at Dan and at Bethel. He was concerned about that. And as Basha comes to the throne, he's still concerned about people going down south. As we discussed last week, when Basha attacks the south, Basha provokes Asa to make an alliance with Ben-Hadad of Damascus in Syria. When Basha was forced to stop that pressure, he'd been building the city of Rama on the border with the south, he has to stop and the pressure is off the south. All right, so those are his wars against Judah. Then part C, Jehu's prophecy, and this is 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 1 to 7. Now Jehu here is termed Jehu, son of Hanani. It's not the same Jehu who later becomes king of the north. But this Jehu was a prophet, and he told Basha that his house would be destroyed, just like that of Jeroboam. You read in verse 3, the Lord says through Jehu, I am about to consume Basha and his house, I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Dogs will eat those belonging to Basha who die in the city, 
and the birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. Sound familiar? Well, the fourth thing, little d, is Elah's reign, and that's in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 8 and following. He was the son of Basha, and again, not an important king. He only reigned two years. You read at the end of verse 8 that Elah, son of Basha, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Tirzah two years. Then you get another revolution, which is little e, or the fifth thing, Zimri's usurpation. And this is 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 9 to 13. Zimri, one of Elah's officials, plots against him. And you read in verse 10, Zimri came in, struck him down, and killed him, and succeeded him as king. So Zimri was one of Elah's officials. He plots against him. He kills him, and then he does the same thing Basha had done. He kills all the house of Basha. And you read in verse 11, He killed Basha's whole family. He didn't spare a single male, whether relative or friend. Zimri's reign, however, was very short-lived. He reigned for a mere seven days. You read that in verse 15. Zimri reigned in Tirzah seven days, and then he killed himself. You read that in verse 18, when Omri marches against Tirzah, where Zimri was. You read in verse 17, Omri and all the Israelites with him withdrew from Gibbethon and laid siege to Tirzah. When Zimri saw the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the royal palace and set the palace on fire around him. So he died because of the sins he had committed, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord in walking in the ways of Jeroboam. Well, then you have six, or a little f on your sheet. There's an interregnum for four years, that is, war between factions. It seems that after the death of Zimri, it seems like there was a time of struggle between Omri and Tibni for the kingship of the north. It seems like it was four years before Omri finally wins out and consolidates power sufficiently to be proclaimed king and ruler. The reason I say that is if you look at 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 15, you read there, In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned in Tirzah seven days. Then Zimri kills himself. But you compare that with chapter 16, verse 23, where Omri becomes king, and you read it's in the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, that Omri becomes king of Israel. And he reigned 12 years. Six of them in Tirzah, that's verse 23. So that's the 31st year compared to the 27th year of Asa. So it seems like there's a four-year period where there's a struggle between Omri and Tibni. Then you read in verse 21, The people of Israel will split into two factions, half supporting Tibni for king, the other half supported Omri. But Omri's followers proved stronger than those of Tibni. So Tibni died and Omri became king. He really only officially begins to reign in the 31st year of Asa. So it looks like there's really a lengthy period of instability and uncertainty about who was really going to win out and become king of the northern kingdom. Okay, that brings us down to capital D, or the fourth main section, and that was the first two dynasties of Israel, and this is the dynasty of Omri. We had the dynasty of Jeroboam, and then we had Basha, and now here we come down to Omri. And then number one of this is uh, Omri himself. We hear something about him, and this is in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 15 to 28. I had three subpoints here, and the first is his succession, and that's chapter 16 of 1 Kings, verses 21 and 22. And we've already looked at that. You read in verses 21 and 22 about that struggle between Omri and Tibni, and then actually in verse 23 you read that Omri becomes king. You read that he reigned 12 years, six of them in Tirzah, which means he reigned six years in Samaria. And then capital D on your sheet is his new capital. You read in verse 24 that he bought a hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver and built a city on the hill calling it Samaria after Shemer, the former owner of the hill. Omri is really an important ruler. He selects a site which was a strategically located site. 
It was well chosen, located on a hill, easy to defend, centrally located in the territory of the northern kingdom, and he established there a new capital city. Samaria remained the capital of the northern kingdom from that point until the time of the captivity in 722 B.C. It quickly became even larger than Jerusalem to be the most important city in Palestine. When the Assyrians finally came and attacked the northern kingdom, Samaria was able to hold out for three years. They laid siege to that city that was a difficult city to take, and they were able to resist until eventually they were starved out. But the Assyrians never broke into the city. But that's the city that Omri sets up as his new capital. Capital C is his statesmanship, and this is on your outline. There's not a lot said about that, but apparently he made friendship with Judah. We don't read of wars between the northern and southern kingdom during the time of Omri. There is no reference to conflict there. It seems that he concluded alliances with some of the surrounding nations as well. And that's clear in the case of the Phoenicians, because his son Ahab marries Jezebel, who was the daughter of the king of Tyre. You read in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31, under the comments on Ahab, where it says that he married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. But undoubtedly, that was a marriage alliance concluded between Omri and Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. Sidon, of course, is a city along the Lebanese coast that is north of Tyre. Well, all right, capital D, Omri's importance. There's not much said about him in 1 Kings. You only have verses 23 to 26, and that's six verses. But the interesting thing is, in Assyrian records, Israel is referred to as the land of Omri, and that's as late as 733 by Tiglath-Pileter III. So that's 733 B.C., and that's 150 years later than Omri. Omri would be about 880 B.C., and in 733 B.C., Tiglath-Pileser III, referring to Israel, speaks of it as the land of Omri. Shalmaneser III calls Jehu the son of Omri. Jehu is kneeling before the Assyrian ruler giving the tribute, but Shalmaneser calls Jehu the son of Omri. This, by the way, is an obelisk that has been found. And this is interesting because Jehu really wasn't the son of Omri. In fact, Jehu was the one who wiped out the dynasty of Omri or Ahab's line. Well, you see, the name was important to the Assyrians, not knowing all the details of the royal lines in Israel. He's just known as the son of Omri because he's on the throne in Samaria. And then also King Mesha of Moab on the Moabite stone says that, quote, Omri, king of Israel, humbled Moab many years and occupied the land of Medaba, end quote. Medaba is an area to the east of Jericho up on the plain in Transjordan, and that's on the eastern side of the Jordan River, of course. So from some of these extra-biblical references, you get the idea that Omri was a rather significant figure, even though the biblical text does not say that much about him. Now, I said something about that earlier in this course, and I think the reason that the biblical text doesn't dwell on Omri is that it's not the purpose of the writer of First and Second Kings to dwell on political and economic factors. It's the covenantal issues, the issues of Israel's faithfulness to the Lord, that are of utmost importance to the writer. And so instead of dwelling on Omri, he dwells on Ahab, Omri's son, who introduced Baal worship through his marriage with Jezebel to the northern kingdom. You get a number of whole chapters devoted to Ahab, much more than you do to Omri. I think we can say that the relation of Ahab to Omri is similar to that of Solomon and David. In this sense, each inherited the kingdom his father had established. Solomon came on the scene after David had really built the kingdom, you might say. And Ahab comes on the scene after Omri has established an important kingdom in the north of Israel. Each one inherited the kingdom that his father had established. All right, that brings us to Ahab, which is number two on your sheet. There are quite a few chapters, specifically 16 through 22, that are devoted to Ahab. You notice I have quite a few subpoints here, too. The ministry of Elijah and Elisha, to a large part, fits into the time of Ahab. 
Now, Elisha goes beyond that into the time of Ahab's sons. But let's look first at Ahab's person. And this is 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 29 to 34. And we read, In the thirty-eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel for twenty-two years. Ahab, the son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. In Ahab's time, Heel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, the son of Nun. And that was 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 29 to 34. So as far as Ahab's person is concerned, he's pictured as doing more evil than any king before him. He's not only continuing the calf worship of Jeroboam, and that almost becomes a trivial thing, he goes much further than that and institutes Baal worship in the north as well. So clearly he violates not only the second commandment, but also the first. He served other gods. You have that list of things he did that ends with a reference to the refortification of Jericho, and that's in verse 34. Jericho had remained what's called an open city since the time of the conquest. Recall, when the Israelites came into Canaan, the Lord gave Jericho into their hands as they marched around the city and the walls fell down. These walls were destroyed at the hands of the Lord. And Joshua at that time pronounced a curse on anyone who refortified Jericho. Now I think there's some significance in that. You can ask the question, why was Jericho to remain an open city? It seems to me that God's intent there is that those ruined walls were to be a testimony or a symbol to all succeeding generations that Israel had received the land from the hand of the Lord as a gift of his grace. It wasn't their military strategy or military might that acquired the land of Canaan for them. The Lord gave it to them. And those ruins were to be a monument to the fact that they received the land from God's hand as a gift of his grace. So it was to remain an open city as testimony to the fact that Israel's security did not lie in military fortifications. Their security rested elsewhere. It was in obedience to the Lord, and the Lord promised that he would protect them. But now you get a king on the throne in the north who isn't a true covenantal king, and he looks at that city with its ruined walls, and in his judgment, that's a liability rather than a strength. It's a liability rather than a symbol of promise. So you read that in Ahab's time, Heel from Bethel rebuilds Jericho. And I think that's to be understood as refortifies it, that is, he rebuilds the walls. It speaks of laying the foundations and setting up its gates. These are defensive structures. But he does that at the cost of his two sons, according to the curse of Joshua. That goes back to Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. Chapter 6 of Joshua tells about the taking of Jericho, and Joshua says in verse 26 of chapter 6, Cursed before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild this city of Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son will he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest will he set up the gates. And that's the curse. And you think all through that time, through the time of the judges, the time of Saul, the time of David, through all the time of Solomon, even with all his great building activity, Jericho remained an open city. It depends on how you set the time of conquest, but if you put it at 1446 B.C., and now you're down into the 800s, five or six hundred years later, So it remained an unfortified city for a long time. But now Ahab doesn't like that. I think that the attitude of Ahab is that he's trusting not in the Lord, but in his own military strategies and fortifications and armies and so forth. 
Now, B is Ahab's wife, and that's in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31. He married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and, of course, Tyre and Sidon were prosperous sea-trading cities on the coast of Phoenicia, which is modern-day Lebanon. The marriage was probably arranged in connection with an alliance between Ethbaal and Omri, Ahab's father. As we read in subsequent narratives, Jezebel turns out to be a very strong-willed person and ruthless woman, to say the least. She probably came to Israel thinking that these people were backward people, uncultured people compared with Tyre and Sidon, thinking their religion was unacceptable. So she establishes Baal worship and maintains a core of 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the goddess Asherah. You read that in 1 Kings chapter 18. When we read, Summon the people from all over Israel to meet me, that's Elijah speaking, on Mount Carmel. Bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So she provided for these 850 heathen prophets that she imported into the northern kingdom. No wonder the northern kingdom was falling apart spiritually. Jezebel also shows that her idea of kingship is completely contrary to the biblical or covenantal idea of kingship in the matter of Naboth's vineyard. Remember, Ahab was displeased because he couldn't convince Naboth to sell his vineyard, and Jezebel enters into that and abuses the judicial system. She arranges for false witnesses to testify against Naboth so that he is stoned, and she takes the property and gives it to Ahab. It's that incident. Of course, Ahab had some complicity in that he went along with it, and it's that incident that leads to Elijah's prophecy of judgment on Ahab's house. But Jezebel certainly is a prominent figure in the northern kingdom this time and had an active role in the introduction of heathen worship into the northern kingdom. 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 32 and 33. He, meaning Ahab, set up an altar for Baal in the temple that he built in Samaria, and he made an Asherah pole, and did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. When Jeroboam had finished with the golden calves, we talked about that before, it seems like, although he was still violating the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee a graven image, he was still attempting to worship the Lord, though by improper means. But it was still the Lord. When he did that, the man of God out of Judah rebuked him for it. And Basha, as he continued the calf worship, was rebuked by Jehu, the son of Hanani. But now you have an entirely new thing. It's not just the golden calves. Now it's Baal worship, and that is introduced by Ahab and Jezebel. The Lord opposes it by sending Elijah and Elisha. So here, sort of in the heart of the book of Kings, at the end of 1 Kings and overlapping with the first part of 2 Kings, you have a great deal of material given over to the ministries of the prophets Elijah and Elisha. I think Baal worship represented the greatest crisis in the religious life of Israel from the time of the entrance into Canaan till the time of Jesus. If you reflect on that, this is a serious crisis for Israel. Is true faith going to remain among God's people? So that there's a great deal of attention given to the ministries of Elijah and Elisha as they confront that particular issue. The interesting thing is, you also have here one of the great periods of miracles and signs, one of the greatest periods to be found anywhere in the Bible. It seems that signs and wonders usually accompany great turning points in the history of redemption. If you reflect on that for a minute, you have, I think, basically four periods in biblical history of great miracles. You have it at the time of Exodus and the conquest. You have them here in the time of Elijah and Elisha. And then you get them during the time of the life of Christ, of course, and the early days of the church through the miracles of the apostles. These are great turning points in the history of redemption, and you then get sort of a profusion of miracles at those critical periods of redemptive history. Okay, what I want to do here is stop our discussion of Ahab for a bit and turn to a discussion of something I've said I'm going to discuss, and that is... How do we get at the meaning of these narratives for us today? 
In other words, how do you preach on the historical narratives of the Old Testament? Let's take a break, and when we get back, I want to address that issue somewhat in a more theoretical way initially, and probably that's all we'll have time to do tonight. Then we will look at some of these narratives of Elijah's ministry, which is where we will move to try to illustrate from some of those passages what we talked about in a more theoretical way. We'll see how to make it practical. We'll see how to get meaning out of them for today. So let's take a break, and we'll come back in about 10 minutes. That is the end of lecture number 10 on the Book of Kings by Dr. Robert Benoit of Biblical Theological Seminary.